All right, um, we are recording this. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next in our series of webinars. Just a few admin uh, details to deal with. The slides for today's uh, webinar are up on the website, with the exception of one set from Eric, which will be up in just a moment. Uh, the video from yesterday's uh, webinar is now linked to the event from yesterday, so we are um, completely up to date on that. And as a final reminder for anyone who hasn't attended one of these events before, this is being recorded so both the text and anything that you say uh, when we open up the phone lines uh, will be publicly available. The document that this uh, webinar relates to is available via the front on the Astrobiology website, and in fact, it has been flipped open, so you can now add comments to it. But we're going to encourage you to add your comments into the text box, as, as Bob has been doing. Uh, and also, once the presentation is finished, we'll open up the phone line, so we'd be delighted to hear from you as well. With that, Frank. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, and uh, welcome. Uh, Ali, welcome Bob, uh, welcome Melissa. So uh, as you guys know, this is the, uh, the next in a series of webinars that uh, are, are based on the uh, activities of focus groups that uh, were uh, joined together uh, last June at the Astrobiology Roadmap uh, meeting. Um, and so today's webinar, uh, is the, uh, here's a Google document that is, uh, I believe, available now, which poses the question, what does the, the simplest uh, life look like? And uh, I'll see if I can make this work there. So the authors of this were Lars Achenbach, Irene Chen, Paul Polkowski, Jim Lyon, Mix, myself, uh, uh, to be uh, Burkhard, Felix, Paul Stigowski, Greg uh, Springsteen, Doug Willett, and Warren uh, Williams, and uh, Eric uh, uh, Miller, will, excuse me, uh, Eric Smith will be talking to us uh, uh, after I'm finished here. So um, the sort of the sub-question to this, or the principal sub-question is, you know, what can synthetic and uh, reductive approaches tell us uh, about early early life. And I'll say up front is something of a disclaimer that my own specialty uh, is that of uh, experimental population genetics and uh, also interested in the origin of uh, organelles and multicellularity. So I'm a little bit uh, further removed from these uh, uh, central questions concerning the origin of life, although I can consider myself a real amateur of, of this work. Okay, so what does the simplest life look like? If we're in our you know, Bio 100 class, we might throw up some slides like this where we have you know, a molecule like a ribozyme, um, a group of these beautiful prions, or a bacteriophage. And then uh, number four on the right is the uh, smallest of uh, 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 known bacterium, uh, Mycobacterium uh, genitalium, has the smallest bacterium of a more or less uh, free living uh, bacterium, although there are others that are intracellular symbionts that have been discovered in the last few years that had even smaller genomes. So, so uh, but is this really uh, what this is all about? Um, this may not actually, uh, none of these may represent what the simplest life uh, on other worlds may look like. It certainly may not even be the simplest life that we would have recognized as such uh, had we been able to, or were we able to get into a time uh, traveling machine and go back four billion years. So we do know, and many of the people uh, participating today may uh, have seen this uh, paper that just came out uh, in astrobiology last month, um, where the uh, uh, publication of this uh, paper by Nofke and Hazen and others uh, uh, indicated 
that uh, there were there clear evidence of bacterial mass uh, going back uh, three and a half billion years. Uh, but as I have in uh, image uh, six below, the oldest things that we've found that could be construed as being alive are certainly not likely to be the simplest. So, for example, here is a picture of a, uh, of a microbial map in the Sipawisset Marsh, uh, marsh uh, near Woods Hole, and the, uh, the purple sulfur bacteria that, um, uh, that are partners in making this map uh, an example of those that are to the uh, to the right, chromatium. Clearly, these organisms are fully formed uh, cells with their own hereditary apparatus and means of harvesting energy for the environment. And so, these uh, we're we're really wanting to to push the question back uh, much further than that uh, three and a half uh, billion year uh, time window. So, as is the convention with the development of these Google documents, there's the question, there's the explanation, and the justification, and then a series of sub-questions. So, the explanation, or we would like to know what are the key events that went into the formation and um, early evolution of life, and what features were um, extant at the time that the first replicating cell or protocell came into existence. And so there on the left is an example um, from uh, Jack Sostak's uh, website and also um, uh, that, that's been borrowed by for a presentation at uh, Museum of Boston. An example of a protocell, um, uh, an enclosed uh, uh, lipid uh, structure with some nucleic acid inside. And we also want to know is there a minimal set of vital requirements uh, including, you know, uh, genetics, uh, self-replication, translation, if uh, proteins are involved, compartmentalization, uh, metabolism. Uh, we would like to know um, in that great leap from, uh, from my cells and vesicles and ribozymes to what we would recognize as a living cell, you know, what, what, uh, what if uh, what of these features, uh, any subset or all of them are necessary for us to call it uh, a lie. <clears throat> so um, we also, and then uh, one of the participants has been uh, hanging us about this, as how do the essential traits of life arise from the geochemical environment? Um, as, uh, as Jim pointed out, uh, almost in a kind of uh, Greek way, back in the back in the beginning, there was really just you know uh, light water, uh, rock, heat uh, to work with. You know, so how do these essential traits of life uh, arise from this uh, geochemistry, and what factors do we uh, consider essential for generating uh, the first uh, recognizable living system? So the group. <clears throat> Uh, was very interested in pushing uh, in the next roadmap the idea that we can approach these uh, enormous questions uh, experimentally. And these uh, experiments could be wet lab experiments or they could be uh, in silico experiments. Um, but they, the, uh, the group saw that there was a... Uh, uh, potentially a clear path to doing that, and I'd like to at least articulate it as I uh, understand what the consensus was. So these experiments could be based on simplifying extant cells. <clears throat> so uh, everybody watching, I'm sure, is familiar with uh, the work that was published by Craig Venter's group not long ago about uh, uh, creating from us new, from uh, human synthesized DNA chunks, a functional uh, microbial cell. This is a paper uh, that's now about five years old that was published in Science. And more recently, uh, people in George Church's lab have taken uh, this further and have tried to uh, model or, 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 or come to um, um, uh, 
uh, a computational understanding of what a minimal cell like uh, Venter's mycobacterium uh, might look like. And then others uh, have taken uh, kind of a, um, a bottom-up approach, uh, notably uh, researchers in Jack Sostak's lab, uh, of trying to take uh, replicating uh, entities and self-replicating vesicles and creating uh, protocells. So one path is to uh, try to simplify uh, extant cells to uh, basically strip them down to their absolute minimum and see what they look like and how easily or how difficult it is to model the behavior. And the other is to take uh, uh, the constituents of protocells and try to build them up from the bottom. So um, these computational models that could come from approaches like that of Church and some others that I'll show you in the next slide, ideally these computational models uh, should generate hypotheses that can be tested uh, in the laboratory. And uh, it is, uh, I think, a, a dominant theme of the conversations in our group was that there should be an interplay between theory uh, and experiment in trying to uh, gain greater understanding of these initial steps uh, in leading to the formation of life. So uh, uh, perhaps um, an interesting paper that people might look at uh, along these lines is the uh, paper published last year in Cell by Kerr et al., where they took Mycobacterium uh, genitalium, this um, uh, smallest of uh, free-living, I hate to even use free-living because it's a, a parasitic bacterium, but at least it's not an intracellular um, a parasite, like some of those interesting uh, organisms living in insect guts described by John McCutcheon recently and Nancy Moran, uh, his postdoctoral advisor. Anyway, the current al uh, paper actually does uh, some uh, brilliant modeling, uh, and the objective of this paper and um, uh, related papers that have come out uh, from this group is to simulate something which uh, we think of as being uh, quite simple, namely the uh, what Jacques Monod called the dream of every cell, which is to become two cells. So they're modeling cell division and uh, taking these uh, various uh, uh, input uh, 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 parameters, chromosome, transcript, RNA, uh, geometry of the cell, et cetera, and send these cell variables to the cell processes as sub-models and then uh, iteratively try to come to a, a model-based understanding of the uh, bacterial uh, uh, process of producing two cells. So I found this interesting quote that right now, uh, running a simulation for a single cell to divide only one time takes about 10 hours and generates half a gigabyte of data. Um, uh, Covert told the uh, New York Times, the lead um, uh, author at Stanford. I find this fact completely fascinating because I don't know that anyone has ever asked how much data a living thing truly holds. Uh, I would add to that remark that that uh, that data that he's talking about there relates to the uh, to the cell cycle and presumably not just the variables within the cell but also the stimuli that are external uh, to the cell and there's a lot more to cells than simply dividing and in fact as most uh, uh, environmental micro microbiologists know perhaps the overwhelming majority of species on this planet spend their time in some form of suspended animation, which, of course, has its own uh, program that would need to be modeled, as well as the exit from that, uh, uh, from that uh, state. <laughs> All right. So those are the uh, explanations. So what about justification? Well, astrobiology uh, operates with implicit and, uh, as time goes on, or more explicit models for life. And our focus in this group 
at trying either by bottom-up or top-down methods to come up with a functioning uh, protocell, um, um, this is what we felt would be a productive way of trying to get at the at the ultimate questions about life's uh, origin. And so the idea is that there's a lot of information that is that, uh, that in, the, in the top-down approach actually starts with uh, with phylogeny represented by this uh, uh, recent uh, Nature paper um, uh, by uh, Gui and uh, Chaudy uh, Um and then on the bottom, synthetic biology, which is represented in the, the bottom panel on the left, where uh, an approach of trying to put together the uh, components that form a cell uh, is the, the object of study. That a, a protocell basically lies at the in intersection of these uh, activities of uh, phylogenetic analysis, which is really basically taking all of life's diversity and trying to not just organize it, but to generate testable uh, hypotheses as to the relationship and the history of uh, the relationships among the uh, extant uh, beings with whom we uh, share the planet. Okay, so knowing this model, and here I'm not talking about a model in terms of uh, a computational model such as that described by Carr et al., but rather the, the protocell model um, can suggest experiments involving alternate biochemistry. So once we get to this, the group felt that um, getting this tool would uh, enable a, a lot of experiments to take place uh, that could themselves be informed by uh, computational uh, analysis. All right, so that's uh, the explanation and justification. Uh, as with the um, other topics, uh, we were asked to identify a number of sub-questions, and in the roadmap, uh, perhaps some of these uh, could be sorted out uh, as was in this 2008 roadmap to uh, uh, suggest particular lines of investigation. So we can ask what evolutionary pressures like you know, selection, mutation, and drift uh, apply to earliest life? What environmental pressures, um, whether they be uh, uh, abiotic factors like carbon availability, uh, energy sources or biotic factors like the distribution and abundance of competitors and uh, predators and uh, parasites. Is life a necessary consequence of certain environmental uh, conditions? And uh, Jim was alluding to this in some of his uh, remarks before the webinar got underway. Uh, as well as what is a minimal energetic uh, source and mechanism um, photoautotrophy as carried out by plants and even by cyanobacteria is a wonderfully complex mechanism. But what, are the, what are the simplest chemistries by which cells can extract or protocells could extract um, uh, energy for uh, carrying out uh, replication and self-assembly uh, drawing from the environment? How did chemiosmosis chemi emerge? Uh, how did the elements of present life arise, and how did they operate in their simplest form? So uh, the lipid bilayer that uh, surrounds cells is also a very complicated structure. You know, what did the simplest uh, lipid bilayer around the, uh, uh, the protocells look like? What, are the, what did the simplest uh, metabolic uh, networks, the minimal networks required for harvesting energy and uh, harvesting uh, uh, carbon and uh, micronutrients from the, uh, the environment. <clears throat> Other sub-questions, this is implicit in the previous slide, is what does phylogenetic analysis tell us about the oldest uh, forms of life and the most common genetic components? Um, can synthetic biology be used to construct a simple life form uh, from atoms up? or do we need to start with components of living cells? A question here, are endosymbionts good models for earliest cellular life? And so 
uh, the mycobacteria model, which has been used to explore the concept of the minimal genome, is in fact, uh, it is not an intracellular, but rather an intraorganismal uh, parasite. And in fact, organisms uh, that have been discovered only in the last couple of years that have even smaller genomes. Genomes on the order, it's smaller than viruses and on the order of some large plasmids. Uh, these uh, symbiotic organisms can only uh, carry out their function by virtue of metabolic interactions with other such organisms or living within a host that provides many of the necessities for life. And so while I think, here's, I'm venturing into the land of opinion here, while I think that these uh, mutualisms and their minimal uh, genome content are very interesting, we need to bear in mind that they are derived characters, not ancestral ones. Number 10, what are the relevant spatial and temporal scales for the origin of life? Number 11, how do the conditions for life's origin differ from the conditions for sustaining life, and how can this uh, inform our discussion about what would constitute a habitable zone uh, on other worlds, and how might we uh, seek uh, a habitable zone uh, uh, remotely kind of using, uh, uh, using probes. And then uh, the last five questions, is life or metabolism a function of structure or information content? or energetics, what are the simplest structures we think of as having a function or as being alive, and what is a cell? Is it defined by compartmentalization? Is it defined, uh, as I suggested, uh, and this went nowhere because it, it's not part of the Google document, is it defined by aging, uh, which uh, is really a manifestation of entropy at work, you know, in, uh, uh, in the living cell. And then, does it make sense to think of earliest life as, quote, just a self-sustained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution, or did these first replicators uh, share genes through lateral gene transfer and start uh, Darwinian evolution with mutation, selection, drift, uh, uh, later on. And then uh, finally, and perhaps most importantly, how does our formation of the questions affect the experiments that we pros propose to do? So uh, the group uh, felt that uh, phylogeny and synthetic biology from the top down and from the bottom up had a lot to contribute to our understanding of not just protocells and modeling protocells, but uh, what, uh, what that would tell us about life's origin. Um, and so all of these questions that I've posed in, this, uh, in the name of the group uh, presuppose that the type of life that we are and the type of life that we have, that we're immersed in here on this planet is in fact the only type of life uh, that's, that's possible. Um, and so, uh, you know, are, are, would we would other life forms be invisible to us because we're stuck on the idea of cellular life? You know, of course, I'm sure that all of us listening here have our favorite science fiction uh, short story or novel where some alternative life form uh, transcends our understanding of cellular life. My personal favorite is uh, Brand Theory is the fire balloon. Uh, but I'm sure everybody could come up with their favorite uh, example. <clears throat> and with regard to this number 16, uh, I was, uh, it sort of brought to mind Heisenberg's uh, dictum that what we observe is not nature itself, but rather nature exposed to our method of questioning. So uh, here are some related questions. I'm not going to uh, just sit here and read this off so that we can uh, move on to our discussion uh, following Eric's presentation. But this big question, what does the simplest life look like? Uh, all of the answers to this question are ultimately related to the evolution of complexity, whether it's complexity uh, at the molecular level and the evolution of ribozymes or in the evolution of a full-blown cell like Mycobacterium uh, uh, genitalium. 
And of course, complexity itself, uh, I love this slide. My friends are embarrassed by how the simplest things in life amuse me. I'm embarrassed by how simple my friends are. So I will let that be my song and dance for now and um, let Eric go, and then we can have our discussion. So thank you for your attention, and uh, thank you for joining the group today. Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, Mike is transferring the slides to a different uh, a different set. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Frank and the authors of this document for inviting an extra layer of commentary. I was not part of the original discussion group, so unfortunately I missed out on what happened. One of the things that means is that the authors, of course, are not to be blamed for any opinions expressed by me. But in some sense, having been an outsider and seen the document, there's a lot of depth, and as I recall the original motivation of doing this sort of massively open solicitation was to make sure that the road mapping effort doesn't foreclose opportunities that we will later wish to support as people come in with ideas that we don't recognize now. So I wanted to offer a couple of points of view that explore topics that are raised in the document with an eye toward keeping our options open. Um, it's very common, almost to the point of being unnoticed, that when people talk about life, whether minimal or the essence of, or anything like that, they often refer to living things. But I think here we have, we have the option to leave open an alternative point of view. We could treat life as if it were a characteristic that things take on, whether they're cells or viruses or prions or whatever. Or we could, we could view the biosphere as a coordinated mosaic of forms of order that have different origins of the, in the Earth and that have been brought into coordination with each other. And some of these are carried as properties of things, others are carried as properties of relations. But when we do that, it gives us the question whether we shouldn't be thinking about either building up to model artificial cells or stripping down modern cells to arrive at small artificial cells. But we could say, is the proper abstraction a need for containment, and what else should be considered within that uh, abstraction? Certainly, uh, William Martin and Michael Russell have argued for a mineral poor hosted origin of early biochemistry. Günther Wechtershäuser, whose name lacks the umlauts with apologies, made a strong case that many reactions in early organosynthesis are easy on sur easier on surfaces than they are in bulks. And so the question becomes, should we be looking for containment but not necessarily cells? We know in the world today that many cellular communities exist in the context of biofilms, which are manufactured secreted matrices that have consequences for differential diffusion rates, uh, for changes in material properties where reactions can be carried out. Um, should, given that many things were exchangeable, genes were exchangeable early, if genomes were incomplete, perhaps metabolites were exchangeable early, should we consider the possibility that a biofilm-like diffusion matrix played an important role even when cells were in a very incomplete stage? so that perhaps the cell is not the only important early form. Um, John McCaskill, in presentations over the years, as part of the program for artificial cellular evolution uh, that was hosted, I guess, in Venice for its duration, was working on the problem of microfluidic devices as a kind of external scaffolding that would allow you to separate the problems of coordination on the way toward making a protocell one can ask if the goal of microfluidics were not to lead to a protocell, but to model other relevant forms of containment, what would a natural way be to organize uh, that kind of experiment? So it remains within the experimental um, motivation of this paper, but it may not presume the role of cells so much. Um, Frank set up a point that I'm very happy to sort of add some enthusiasm for, Life is many things, it's many structures and many relations and many kinds of organization. When we think about minimality, there certainly is no reason to think that all things are minimized together and the minimization of one may force maximization of others. 
the National Science Foundation hosted a meeting on minimal life maybe three or four years ago under Prostan Blagoyev, which was directed to the question, is there a horizon of minimality so that you can't get smaller in one dimension without necessarily becoming more complicated in another? Uh, again, I emphasize minimal life may not mean minimal living thing if things are not the right level to focus on. Are we concerned with minimality of genomes as structures for memory and control? Are we concerned with the minimal dependence on the ecosystem, the minimal complexity that the ecosystem itself has to have? Are we concerned with the minimal self-sufficient biochemistry and under what conditions, fluctuating, protected, hot, saline, et cetera? And these are questions that can be partly done in the purview of synthetic biology, but they also drift over into synthetic organic chemistry. And so perhaps that's an area that's an interface with other uh, position papers, not as central in this one, but important to keep. Um, the question of the order of steps is a deep and really hard one. Molecular replication is important now, but it's a system property. Compartments are important, and they also involve many levels of system aggregation, phase separation, containment, topologies, active transport, bioenergetics, and so forth. When we think about the order in which things came online in early life, what's the relation between the advent of replication and the advent of compartments? What kinds of compartments? Minerals, pores, surfaces, vesicles, uh, composomes have been proposed by Doran Lancet and Daniel Segre and collaborators. How many distinct compartments is a cell even? How many distinct compartmentalization roles does it perform in bioenergetics, in catalysis, in the separation of reaction domains, in homeostasis? Um, when we think about molecular replication, what exactly do we have in mind for molecular replication? It's a system level feature today that involves at the minimum RNA and proteins, but it's many types of RNA and proteinaceous uh, highly evolved molecules. That brings to what I think should be the next slide, which is that the problem of understanding how ribosomally mediated translation relates to the rest of life is just enormously hard. And there are other papers and other investigators in this meeting who are dedicated to that particular problem. But it strikes me as one of the most difficult and enigmatic major transitions to see through harder in some ways than biochemistry, harder in some ways than cellularization, because it's an assembly of so many tuned components into a system. So one of the questions of minimality that seems pressing to me is, how many qualitatively distinct stages did molecular replication go through to arrive at the ribosome? And can we in any way reconstruct what those must have been? If there were many levels of ribosomal or of pre-ribosomal molecular system replication, which ones of those may have been prior to or posterior to one or another form of compartmentalization? So these are sort of attempts to unpack details of sub-questions that seem to me to be resident in this document. And I think that's all that I had to say. I'm very happy um, to open to the discussion. Andy, you might be muted. Try that one again. Let's see. Um, thank you to both of you. Um, so I think at this point, we can just open our, our phone lines up. Um, Ali, I can see that you had comments or uh, questions, so uh, go right ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. OK. Just a question from Frank. Frank, uh, in the title you mentioned, I mean, they mentioned synthesis and uh, basically uh, what I'm looking at here, reductive approaches. Obviously, you refer to phylogeny and synthetic biology. But also what is important here from the point of the chemistry is uh, reducing effective elements. If you look at biological entities, the uh, proteins. Uh, Ali, so, sorry to interrupt. Um, but it's, it's hard to hear you. Can you either speak up or um, Maybe. go move closer? I just disconnected my headset. How is that right now? That's better. That's better. Better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Frank, in the title here, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, great. Uh, there's the indication of synthetic and reductive approaches, obviously uh, referred to phylogeny and synthetic biology. Uh, but one of the points uh, I'm trying to refer to is uh, reducing capacity of elements, for example, in biological um, uh, tissues, in entities. We're dealing with nitrogen. I was just discussing with uh, Ian Miller yesterday. He's from New Zealand. And if you look at except the fertilizers and, for example, explosives, we have a reducing element that is basically is an entity of life. So having that reducing capacity of elements can be basically a uh, very important element in initiation of life. Also carbon, in other side, for example, in photosynthesis, carbon is going to be reduced. It's going to transfer from CO2 during process to, um, for example, glucose and carbohydrate. So these are basically elements that have reductive capacity, not from point of biology, but also from point of chemistry. What is your perspective on that? Frank, I think you muted. Just try and on your cell phone. I'm 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 sorry, but I I did not understand. Uh, I did not understand. There was a, a commentary from Ali about uh, uh, reductive chemistry, but then it faded off there at the very end. So I, I hate to make this a cumbersome process, but could you please repeat the question, uh, Frank? Uh, Basically, you mentioned the title mentioned about uh, phylogeny and synthetic biology uh, based on synthesis and reductive uh, process. But this reductive process just ignites something in my mind, which is basically reducing capacity of elements. For example, nitrogen has extensive reducing capacity. And if you look at tissues, biological entity, nitrogen extensively involved in these tissues and these entities, and they're in reduced forms, except the synthetic, for example, chemicals like fertilizers or explosive use nitrogen, the rest of the nitrogen on the planet would be in a form of reduced form. So having nitrogen as one of the essential elements of life can be important. Yes, absolutely, I agree. And actually, your, your point, um, I think that most, uh, and Eric, maybe you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here, and Ali as well. I think most people involved in in synthetic biology uh, are are really um, they're thinking mainly about um, aerobic processes. Uh, so there there uh, there are a number of, of assumptions. That are built into these um, studies, um, so they're, they're, at least in their current form, they're not starting from the ground up. That is to say, with uh, you know the consideration of you know the the reductive capacity of, uh, of the atmosphere and the, the principal elements and the forms of those elements uh, that were available. For uh, you know, quasi biological transformations, you know, for say 4.1 billion years ago, am, am I getting your point correct? Yes, I'm getting my point. And um, I have other comment too, which is I think is important. Uh, in your slide, you have a uh, basically bacteriophage, which is a virus, and also uh, there's indication in section nine of the sub questions. Uh, Endosymbionts. Endosymbionts, obviously, they need host. But what is interesting so far, when I follow up these uh, basically discussions, I haven't seen the view of virologists. What we have mostly is biologists and basically molecular biologists and chemists. I think having involved the viruses as an entity which can be a question of initiation of life can be very important. Uh, uh, not only, uh, not necessarily they need a host. We have a, a theory right now, hypothesis, which is called virus-first hypothesis. And uh, basically this uh, indicates that viruses can be basically, uh, as an element of self-replicating, can be initiation of life, and then they find a host and develop their structures. So virus as entity can be important element in study of the basically the formation of the life. 
excellent point. And, you know, in, uh, please someone jump in and uh, correct my scientific ignorance, but uh, haven't, haven't there recently been discovered viruses of viruses? Is, is, am I hallucinating here? Holly? Uh, there are two hypotheses right now about uh, basically – uh, uh, development of viruses. One of them is a regression, one of them is progressive. Progressive is referring to example like, a, for example, retrovirus that RNA is going to transfer to DNA and so on, migrate to nucleus and uh, of the host cells. Other one is a regressive hypothesis uh, that basically these two indicate that the viruses, they need the host. But also we have a theory, hypothesis called first virus first hypothesis that they can basically, they can be initiated and they basically assemble initially and then they find their host. I can't hear it, Frank. No, there, there was in fact, um, yes, we're talking about a virus finding a host, but there was a it was a, a French group, uh, now this is coming back, that um, published a paper in Nature uh, three or four years ago, um, uh, basically a, a satellite virus, which is in fact itself a virophage. So this is something that um, I know that the uh, what, it, what it itself is, is parasitizing requires a host, but nevertheless, you know, the, uh, the the discovery that the, the Matreshka doll can sort of be pushed back to viruses and viruses, I think, is a uh, – uh, it, it certainly puts some points up on the board for um, a, a virus-first view of the evolution of life. So it's, it's excellent comments that really should be incorporated into the, uh, you know, the, the final document uh, on the simplest life. Okay, sure. Other thoughts or questions um, that anyone wants to raise or that could help the author team who will obviously be able to watch this video as well because not all of them by any means are represented here. Anything else that you want to raise uh, around this topic? This is Bob Bruner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Bob. I brought up some po points early in the discussion. I'd like to c cover those if that's all right. Mm. Yes, please go uh, ahead. Now, the first thing I brought up was these uh, biofilms, which uh, Bob Hazen called flat life. And uh, he just wrote a paper that came out last month um, and um, his uh, his title is uh, the paleo mineralogy of the Hadean eon a preliminary species list now in his um, body of his paper he talks about the um, diverse roles of mineral surfaces in protecting, selecting, concentrating, templating, and catalyzing uh, reactions of prebiotic organic molecules. And so um, I don't know if the term flat life is still being used, but uh, anyway, that uh, gets into some of the stuff of Gunter Wachterhauser and uh, uh, Martin and so forth uh, concerning these biofilms. Um, now, um, uh, I am going to the Gordon Conference next month, and I have selected some minerals um, to take as an exhibit. I'm, I'm a volunteer at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and um, I decided to pick minerals that are the most discussed in the common origin of life theories. So for instance, the first five I list on my uh, 
comment there. Pyrite, chalcopyrite, sphalerite, galena, and alabandite are really from um, Armin Malkajanian, uh, a famous uh, uh, origin of life theorist. And of course, the pyrite is also from um, Ferris at uh, RPI. Um, so you sort of kill two birds with one stone there. Um, they also are part of uh, Gunther Wachtershauser theories. Um, then we have uh, Steve Benner, who came up with the theory that um, life could not have started on the Earth because we were lacking some critical uh, borates and molybdates. Um, and the only way those could have been created was on the planet Mars. So uh, it's interesting that in the list of Hadean-era minerals uh, that uh, Bob Hazen put forward, uh, there's 420 on the list, and the three that Benner is, is talking about are not on that list. Um, and then we have, uh, that's, uh, those, those are um, tourmaline, uh, peridot, and culminite, and wolfenite. And then, of course, we have Mike Russell at NASA, who is talking about olivine, phthalite, forsterite, and montmorillonite, I'm sorry, uh, serpentine um, uh, in that process. And there's many other scientists that talk about the serpentine process. Then we have uh, the Mars people are talking about what's at the bottom of Mount Sharp, uh, montmorillonite, um, some peroxine, and um, uh, Hazen uh, suggested amphibole would be another one uh, in that series. And then there's, of course, the proof of water on Mars, which is the uh, gypsum and um, gutite. And uh, then there's the uh, dating minerals, the zircons and apatites that Moises uses in his work. So there's uh, not that many the, uh, minerals that uh, somebody could take and make a study of the properties of those minerals in creating biofilms. Um, you know, the, the theory is that the, uh, and you know, you can read Wachtershauser or um, uh, Melkajanian about how the, and, and also Russell, about how the, these uh, minerals, they trade protons and electrons back and forth with the organic molecules, making them larger and larger and forming into possible life. So um, those are the two points I wanted to make, and I'd like, love to hear some comments from some of you folks. Hi, Bob. This is Eric. Uh, thank you also for some emails that you sent um, to me and George Cody long ago, sort of at the beginning of this uh, process. Yeah. Um, it would be wonderful if there were more people working on this. It would be wonderful if there were a thicker representation of the expertise of geologists, both Hadean Earth geologists and also planetary scientists who can say a good bit in detail about other environments in this area. Um, you know, my hope is that with Mary and Michaels having structured the process as they have, there's been ample room for that voice to be present here so that if then people come offering to do work on mineral organosynthesis, there will be room in the NASA budget to support it because a lot of it is just scanning parameter space. You know, in addition to the mineral environment, we have, to, we have sort of a parameter space of temperature, pH, ionic strength, salinity, and then what you think the relevant inputs are. Do you have carbon monoxide? Do you have more active organics like pyruvate? This essentially requires manpower with a relatively sophisticated organic geochemistry bent to design experiments that can survey this parameter space efficiently in areas that are likely to turn up something useful. And so anything we can do to make room to support such programs, if good people bring them in, I strongly support. I would uh, concur. I would add that, uh, you know, I, 
uh, when I was a, uh, a postdoc, I had the, uh, the, the great uh, honor and privilege of hearing uh, Gunter, uh, Dr. Hauser at, uh, at MBL uh, give, give one of the, uh, the evening uh, lectures. It was really a, this was, uh, you know, towards the, the end of his life. It was a really quite a stunning presentation. And although I don't do it anymore, uh, for some, some of my research, uh, maybe seven or eight years ago, uh, dealt with uh, iron and sulfate uh, reducing bacteria. Granted, these are very complicated organisms. I'm not even proposing that they be considered in the sort of, you know, origin of uh, origin of uh, uh, life experiments. But nevertheless, I've, I've, I've retained an affection for that, um, and I would say that. And Eric, maybe you can give me a yay or nay on that. I would say that the, there were perhaps not as many uh, geologists or specifically geochemists um, uh, particip participating in the process as um, as uh, as I might have liked to have seen. Is, is that would you agree or not? Yeah. I concur with that. You know, this is a strange thing in the community because it's clear that the expertise exists among people who are in this discussion and even many who were at Wallops. Um, my personal take on this is that space needs to be made to form communities, which means giving a sufficient time horizon to encourage people to learn from each other because it's a long reach from the planetary science to find out what's geologically plausible to the mineralogical expertise to understand what the electron and proton exchange properties are of particular minerals in particular conditions to the organic chemistry to understand what relevant reaction classes are to search for to then computational chemistry problems how can networks complete where can you get concentration and then to bring this together with the things that astrobiology people have often looked at, which is how do the end products of these synthetic systems provide a path into what we understand as life and its dynamics today. But this is an extraordinarily long intellectual reach for any expert in any domain to engage well with the people in the other domains. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what one can do. You work on it privately to try to build community where you can, and then you cheerlead from the sides to hope that organizations like NASA will institutionally encourage making these collaborations thicker. That's. Uh, uh, I mean, what what funds um, uh, biogeochemistry work? is uh, NSF, but also DOE, and DOE in particular interested basically in decontaminating of, um, of aqueous phase uh, radionuclides and uh, also de dealing with things like you know, uh, arsenic toxicity in the waters. And so there's, a, there's been a, a quite a good chunk of money that's gone to the biogeochemistry community over the last, you know, 20 years, you know, that has supported a lot of wonderful basic research. But it's really been, um, you know, the, how shall I say, the, the aim of most of this research has not been, you know, sort of open-ended. What, what are the variety of geochemistries that could, uh, you know, provide a scaffold for protocells and for primitive energy uh, transformations, but rather uh, how do we better understand uh, extant organisms and their interactions with these uh, uh, minerals with a view towards, uh, you know, the, the pushing aqueous phase metal concentrations one way or another. Yes. This is a thing that came up to some degree within the Wallops conversation, so perhaps it's useful in this webinar to sort of have it available in the record so people can know it happened. There's still a lot that is not understood about states of carbon in the Earth's mantle and crust and in the subcrustal water systems. There are some things that are understood, but in geophysics, 
the experts are far from having a full synthesis. There is basic science to be done there that's of interest to the geophysicists and geochemists. Perhaps this is an opportunity for astrobiology to sort of advertise itself as a source of basic science in uh, geochemistry and planetary science mm -hmm. to combine resources. Okay, uh, we are just coming up to the top of the hour. Uh, unless there are any further comments that people want to chip in, I would like to thank our presenters and uh, just to remind you that this video will be up on the website shortly. It takes a day or so to, to crunch it. So uh, if you want to refer any of your colleagues to it, um, just come back and have a look in the events section uh, on the website and you'll be able to get the link directly to this video. And I see Frank has a point. Yeah, and I would encourage Ali and uh, Bob and uh, Melissa and Polly, if if, um, if you wanted to write directly uh, mm. your comments to uh, uh, Eric or myself, um, I am Frank Rosenzweig at umontana.edu, and uh, uh, I would be uh, very keen on communicating those comments, um, you know, sort of your collected thoughts to the group so that when uh, meetings occur to sort of refine this uh, this uh, question, uh, that your opinions will be taken into account. And just to build on that, if your comments relate directly to the paper, I can see that Paulie is saying that they will as, as well, Ali, um, the paper is now open for commenting. So if you have general discussions that you want to make with Eric and Frank, that's one thing. But if you can help the team by uh, commenting directly in the paper, it's a very simple process. You go to the paper, we ask you ideally to log into your Google account first so that we know who you are when you add the comment because it makes it easier if people want to come back to you for clarification. Um, then that's a great thing to do as well. We need to uh, get as much input for the papers as we can so that they can move on to the next stage. With that, I think we are now out of time. So uh, thank you to our presenters, thank you to our attendees. And our next event is going to be in the new year. I think it's the 8th, uh, but all the details will be on the website and they will go out in our regular weekly email as well. So thank you very much. Cheerio.